come is the comic disaster that is my life. The British are coming. <sighs> Mama done hooked a fish. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is And Just Like That, The Writer's Room, the official companion podcast of And Just Like That from Max. I'm Michael Patrick King, writer, director, and executive producer of And Just Like That. And I'm here with writer and consulting producer Susan Fales Hill. Hello, Michael and listeners. And the writers of this particular episode, supervising producer Samantha Irby, calling in from Michigan. Hello from the Midwest. And first time writer on And Just Like That this season, Lucas Frolick. Hey, everybody. Hey, Lucas. Well, this episode is episode 205, and it is called Trick or Treat, which will give you a hint. It's our Halloween episode with a lot of tricks and a lot of treats. If you haven't seen the episode, I would suggest that at this point, you turn us off and turn it on because we will be talking about things that will spoil the fun. The tricks will be gone and the treats will be clear before you want them to be. So we start the episode with our ongoing couple in transition, I would say, Miranda and Shay. Where we started with this episode is that thing when you're moving in with somebody sort of too soon. Yeah. Want to talk about Samantha moving in with somebody? Uh, Yeah, it is the worst idea anyone could ever have. But we tried to highlight how hard it is to fit your life around someone else's life when the two of you are doing two different things, like night person and day person, lawyer and comic. What we were trying to begin was to show how the strains of the Miranda DNA completely differs from the Che DNA. And I remember in the writing room, we did, we tried a lot of different ways, but we came up with that simple idea of one's a night person and one's a day person. Mm-hmm. It seemed to be clearer. Well, that and the stress of having to go back to Brooklyn to take care of Brady and the guilt of that. So just it, it amplifies what's already like an awkward situation of like having enough stuff there, underwear there, whatever else, and putting having a drawer at someone's house and just kind of living out of a suitcase. So it's just kind of like this nightmare stress situation that puts strains on what is already a complicated situation. So, uh, yeah, and then the stuff. It's a lot of the schlepping. Yes. <laughs> and you know, when you get a, when you get a, a, a script from the writers, there's always a little clue as to what their frame of mind is. And when the first read this, the very first thing that surprised me was in the stage direction, they had written that Che is sleeping in a Georgia O'Queef t-shirt. <laughs> 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 yeah, Lucas, why? Where, what was that about? <laughs> I, you know, my, an ex-boyfriend of mine gave me that T-shirt, and I was like, it, it just stuck in my head as something that, like, one time I accidentally wore it around and f- forgot that I was wearing it, and someone made a sound at me, and I was taken aback, and I was just like, one of those uncomfortable things, just like, the only shirt I had at his house was that hat. So it was an iconic uh, moment that I somehow snuck in there as a bold choice, but it felt like definitely a Che territory comedy-wise to have that shirt, and just the, initially there's a version almost where Miranda was going to be wearing the shirt out, and the, the just the kind of juxtaposition of that, but then we just settled on that, you know what, that'll be... Che wearing that. I love that your walk of shame moment led to this delicious (laughs) little... Well, it was also in COVID and I thought I was wearing a mask and so I thought they made... They wouldn't recognize how bad your taste was? (laughs) No, they made this this (laughs) noise at me and I was like, how dare they? to Harvard. I thought, you know, when you did the first queef sound, we were going to be fine. And now that you've done a callback to the queef, that's the fun really of the whole thing is some writer has a crazy thought that from their own past that they then Mm -hmm. force into the script. (laughs) Yes. And then it's up to us to figure out how to use it or to keep it. And I looked at 10 different Georgia O'Queef <laughs> t-shirt choices every time they did them. And I was like, oh, it's too heavy. It's too cartoony. It's in your face. It's grotesque. Then we came up with the, the Grateful Dead tie-dye Georgia O'Queef. But the point is, if you're watching the episode, it goes by. You don't even see yeah. it, but we mm-hmm. know it's there. So it's for in our the, viewers, yeah. was that a bespoke T-shirt oh, then that was completely made? Completely made. There was many many which, many emails. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so we see Miranda getting up very early and moving from Che's apartment through the subway system back to Brooklyn, where she's making breakfast and doing laundry for Brady, then back on the subway system to her higher learning moment at Columbia. And it's a cycle of guilt and abuse. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, she's asking her son, do you want to decorate the stoop? (laughs) (laughs) 
just the most forced fun and the, this this like her making pancakes but not pumpkin pan. It was just like all it's kind of like almost this manic energy of like I can be this perfect, I can be the girlfriend, you know, and I can also be the perfect mom and housewife and make it all work. And it's just kind of this sad half breakfast and her decorating that stoop alone is just kind of a slow, uh, yeah, <laughs> digression. One thing I love about that scene, too, is uh, Miranda sort of grappling with her son being still her, you know, your son's always your baby, but he's not a dude who wants to decorate the stoop anymore. Like, he's growing up. He doesn't need mommy to make his cereal. And I think that's probably a realization that's tough for everybody. I also love that we show in that little interaction between Miranda and Brady that Brady got her sarcastic gene. Yeah. He mm -hmm. did not get mm -hmm. Steve's yes. sincereness. He got her <laughs> when your mom her. is yes. sarcasm, capital S. He <laughs> yeah. shouts yeah. right back at her. Why? Isn't our house scary enough? I mean, it's a good jab. And that's before coffee. Yes. So you can just imagine For how sure. Brady's going to be after a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. One of the other th technical things we had to do as a writing room with these episodes is start to stage the year ahead out. We wanted to move through seasons so that everybody was moving along. Relationships weren't ending or starting in three episodes unless they were three months between them. And one of the markers is the seasons. And fall in New York is amazing. It's iconic. You know, whenever you're doing something that's in New York, we try to follow something that actually is in New York. So we came up with... Well, there's a fundraiser that happens every Halloween in the park and grown people <laughs> wear costumes, <laughs> very elaborate costumes, <laughs> and are very happy to be there. Uh, and so we wanted to yeah. mirror that and we got to shoot it in Prospect Park in, in Brooklyn, which right, is absolutely exquisite. Like the house that was, yeah. Uh, and it's the New York Parks Conservancy, which, yes, it, which exactly. of course covers all the parks in the city. And it is something Charlotte would do. And the other fun thing about the Halloween is, you know, we have such this amazing costume department. The first thing we had to say to them is boring rich people costumes because <laughs> you know they want to go they want to go La you know, they want to they want to go they want to go so Mardi big Gras. they're going to go there anyway but you have to put a lid on it so that what you get are doctors nurses like these are Upper East Side duds really is the point of the whole storyline. I mean, it was also like the most epic day of shooting where we had, you know, we're shooting two to three times what we'd usually shoot in one day. So it's all the energy there was just unbelievable. And every single extra, it comes across on screen, but like in person, they went to the nines on each person spending so much time on each outfit. There was like a, a two-hour Zoom, Zoom meeting going through every outfit that was going to be used and making yeah. sure. And Michael saying, no, yeah. <laughs> That's you know, the really hardest outfit of all was Carrie. Yes. Because, you know, like, first of all, we don't like to do big costume things, especially for someone who is known to be basically in a costume every day. So <laughs> it started with Coco Chanel because we wanted from the writing room to her to be in something that she would have in her closet that we didn't want Carrie to go to any extra effort because that felt not cool. And not in character. Yeah. Well, and, and then yeah. Miranda's not necessarily, so she has to dress up in some way, but it has to be yeah. something in her lane. So the idea was it went from Coco Chanel, and then that kind of fell flat. And then it was going to be the next thing that we had in the script was, uh, you know, Audrey Hepburn and Breakfast at Tiffany's. And this is one of the few times Sarah Jessica read it and said, we can do better. It's been done. Mm. It's been seen. It's there's nothing special about it. It is a visual clam so, at this point. <laughs> yeah. But Sarah Jessica, I said, well, okay, who is it? I'll throw it to her. She knows Carrie. And she came back like a little bit later with Helen Gurley Brown <laughs> with a picture of Helen Gurley Brown with the bows. And I said, All okay, in. but only if you promise there are bows. Said, oh, I'm on it. <laughs> Charlotte is going to kill us for not wearing costumes to her fundraiser. I am wearing a costume. I'm Helen Gurley Brown, writer and founder of Cosmopolitan Magazine, circa 1970. Oh, I just thought you were you. When have you ever seen me wear bows in my hair like this? I don't know, Wednesday? And then we get to one more very bizarre costume choice which is Charlotte as Carrie Russell in The Americans. I mean, talk about a tiny 
comedy thread. And that's who who it, is that? Elisa, it was a full Elisa. obsession. Just Elisa Zaretsky became obsessed. Like, you know, you ever see like um a dog with one of those rubber toys that has a treat inside and they won't let it go. <laughs> She was constantly oh saying, God. the Americans, the Americans, well, the Americans. Any, any topic somehow would shift back to the Americans, too. Even just like on set, yeah. somehow eventually she just had but this it, one track mind. the whole story. Yeah, it was oh, great. my God, it's so great. I've never seen anyone more passionate about, <laughs> about the something that's dumbest a little thing you've ever not thought of. She life. It was really incredible. loved the idea that Charlotte and Harry thought they were on the inside, <laughs> yeah. but were the outliers. Yes. Like they could not turn yeah. that over. They were so excited about yesterday's toys, essentially. Yeah, it was not. <laughs> it really. And so offended that and no then, one recognized. And them. then Kristen, yeah. literally, is the essence of Carrie Russell's character. Yeah, she just keeps doing her hair thing and her look <laughs> on her it's eye. Such a subtle thing. And I yeah. just said to her. You are so good as K Carrie Russell. She says, because I want to be Carrie Russell. <laughs> <laughs> There's also just something so tragic and funny of just no one recognized you at a Halloween party. You think it's going to be your big night and your crowning moment. You're so proud of an outfit. And then just time after time, it's just like. Explaining. Yeah, explaining constantly in the <laughs> befuddled looks. It's just like. <laughs> so the bigger machine of the episode from the writing room, from our point of view, is now we really have to start to deliver new friends to each other. These characters have now been introduced. They've all been on their individual runways. Now it's our job to find a way to make them cross out of their individual lanes like Naya and Miranda, LTW and Charlotte, Seema and Carrie. How do we do it? Well, this that party to me was like the assembly ball in Pride and Prejudice. It was the most <laughs> organic way to throw together yeah. all these characters mm -hmm. because it made all the sense in the world that Charlotte said, y'all come, and everyone showed up. And it was the chance for Seema to show up. It was the chance for Miranda to say to Naya, hey, you're ready to meet men, come. And they were all there. Yeah, and just like that, everybody kind of using Halloween for different purposes, like some casually showing up and then Naya going in, like, you know, when you're suddenly single, it's you go to events with a purpose suddenly. And so she goes there and this purpose looking so hot and it's the... As Eartha Kid yeah, in the cat suit. Yes, Eartha Kid yeah. is cat woman. <laughs> and so it's like that her, changes the whole nature. And not to mention, we, we, go, we go pretty hard in the writing room with the looks and the characters. There were like five different versions of what Catwoman is. And we, you know, the, the Michelle Pfeiffer latex Catwoman, and we kept saying... Naya doesn't do that. No. Karen would yep. look amazing in that. But that's not Naya. Naya is a teacher. She'd go softer. So but I also believe her mother was an Eartha Kitt fan. And so she grew up knowing about Eartha Kitt and Eartha Kitt is Catwoman. Everything comes from an organic place that's true to the character in the same way that SJP said, I'm not going to be, I, I can't be Holly Golightly. Yeah. I so. mean, the reality is that is part of the writing. Yes. To go back and forth with the designers and the actors and say, but we think Naya wouldn't go to that trouble. We don't think Naya has latex in her house. <laughs> no, she has some naughty lingerie. We know <laughs> that. We know. But latex yes. might be. But it was really the fun of it. What was it like to start to write those four ladies? The one thing that made it easy, because you feel like you're weaving a bunch of disparate people together is it's totally believable that if someone's throwing a fundraiser you're just like invite everybody I know I don't care who it is bring her bring her bring her just make sure she brings her checkbook it was like the first time I have gotten to write a scene with everybody and it was like really fun and nice but Lucas you could tell me if it was not no fun I mean or it was nice. like already like I, I love Halloween so much and I love this show and this world so much. So that together was like the ultimate dream where at certain points I was like, I feel like I'm writing fan fiction right now because it's just so mm -hmm. like the playing the game of like, well, this person be dressed like that and that. And so getting all those characters together, it was like it was truly the most joyful, fun scene work. And then and then send, mm -hmm. Sam and I sending the script back and forth to each other was just this fun game of like trying to make <laughs> each other smile in whatever way, which I think can be the yes. best part of co-writing an episode. Let's talk about LTW and Herbert. <laughs> At the end of episode four, because uh, LTW is trying to defend her husband to her father, Lawrence, after having a very complicated conversation where he said, I'm not going to run for comptroller because it's going to be too much on you and we can do it in the future and I know how much this is important. When her father accuses him of being somebody who's only consumed with money, she blurts out, he's running for comptroller. 
So Halloween, of course, LTW is the bride of Frankenstein in what looks like a Hervé Leger strap Franken bride of Frankenstein. And the great <laughs> thing about Nicole is her LTW is many things. But when you see her, you're like, yeah, she would go too far on Halloween. She would go that she would be fun on Halloween. And of course, she's dancing with Anthony. And now this is the first time they've ever been soulmates because they're fun. They're well, dancing to a dance TLC. Floor can unite people very quickly. Mm -hmm. Dance floor and some drinks can suddenly speed up oh. the friendship. You know, <laughs> yeah. it really. And they we want to burn the floor. Yeah. We yeah. Are and they have the floor life. because yeah. they're hot. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's undeniably hot, and they're dancing. And then uh, Herbert shows up, not in his Halloween costume, which is. Which is George Washington, which he left at home, <laughs> and there's no. Basically, it's it's fun to see this couple where one is all in all into Halloween and one is like nothing to do with it. And it's just a nice balance there. And they have this little thing that brings them home, but at, at home, he's a little bit more tender in the private sector of it all. And it's, he comes in with the George Washington looking very sexy in a complicated, mm -hmm. <laughs> complicated look and is, uh, yeah, he just it has swagger. And then some, and it's a sweet moment of them in bed. I love this storyline because it underscores the mixed marriage nature of their union because she is that, more bohemian, free spirit, daughter of a playwright. Uh, and he is that proper bourgeois respectability politics. Um, and in, I think for a lot of members of the Black audience, it will underscore the notion that uh, a serious Black man cannot get away with showing up in a Halloween costume. We have to leave mm -hmm. that to the white boys sort of thing. So there, because? There's some, because if you're trying to be taken seriously and they're not used to seeing you in the arenas of politics and banking and leadership, you can never depart from that proper costume or you will not be respected. Uh, we have to say a nice wink to the audience. Oh, it's beyond meta because Chris Jackson, who plays Herbert, was George Washington in Hamilton. So when we knew we were going to do costumes, we were like, we got to get Chris in the George Washington outfit. And Chris was, I'll get my George Washington costume from Hamilton. So he is wearing his George Washington costume from Hamilton. The levels of authenticity. Yes. The levels yeah. of meta, 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 meta. From Susan's closet to the Hamilton dressing room. <laughs> Not we got mine, my friends. <laughs> okay. The wig was us. <laughs> but the costume and the swag is definitely Chris. Oh, and then, of course, goodness. she goes to touch his hair. And he says, don't touch my hair. Which is what she always <laughs> says to him. <laughs> They're so cute together. It's almost disgusting. I love the two of them. Yeah. You know, we have these really weird agendas that we cover up with words and story. But one of the agendas for me in this episode was to get Carrie at a bar having a Cosmo. We lay very lightly on the Cosmos. We don't bring them out too much. Every now and then there's a Cosmo and it's like, oh, and they, they, that means something when you see a Cosmo it's on a and just like that. Like that. <laughs> you know, it was like Cosmo Central on Sex and the City, but on and just like that, when Carrie has a Cosmo, something's happening. And so we got them to this gorgeous hotel bar. The Baccarat Hotel yeah. Bar, which is a, actually a very chic place so in New York. So chic. And I really... There was so much discussion about it being a hotel bar. Like, I remember you being like, hotel bars are the thing. It's gonna be at a hotel. Well, remember, <laughs> we actually did our research with a single oh, woman yes. of a certain age because the women of a certain age in the room are all Married and booed up. So <laughs> booed up. Oh my God. Susan, you delight me to no end. Get your urban dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> From Bakyaha to boot up. That's right. the duality. That's right. But we we spoke to this woman who is single and is yes. in her fifties. And she said, we asked her, where would you go if you were looking to find viable? viable <laughs> men, not mm -hmm. not somebody that is just the last thing that was left standing. Right. And she said hotel bars. So. Right. And so then we went on the search. And you know, it, there are really cool and hot places in New York that if you film them, they don't translate to cool, cool and hot. They're not mm -hmm. visually what they are. But the Baccarat Hotel bar is Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it, it is, is gorgeous. We're showing New York another way, part of New York that no one's ever seen. And there's Carrie Bradshaw in the middle 
of two new single women friends, and they're both getting hit on. <laughs> Seam is getting hit on by a guy named Ed. Yes, his name is Ed. <laughs> if you then follow along, he suffers um. from ED, but his character's name is Ed. That's the beginning of her storyline, which is always fun on Sex and the City, was hot guy, uh-oh, what's going to yeah. come up? Classic or not combo. come up in this case. And then there's Naya, who's we discover has only seen two dicks. That's a quote. I'm not no, talking no, out of no, school. No, we're not. And because she was married to Andre Rashad for 20-something years, and they started dating as sophomores in college. They went right. to Howard. So she really has. And when you, they and say that. And she said when, she had her first boyfriend. She's she get met her where? Eyes on some where? More dicks. At the Model UN. At the Model UN. <laughs> who, who's the nerd who wrote Model I, I, UN, I, Samantha? Sam. Uh, <laughs> Not to call you a nerd, but I remember you in the first drafts of that. Yeah. Like, Listen, yeah, I alone. And we, what we were dealing with with Naya also is that when you divorce, you revert to the age you were when you were single in terms of your dating habits. For sure. And so she's regressed in a way. She doesn't know what to do. So Naya has a one night stand for the first time and does the walk of shame in the morning out of the hotel and is delighted. It's delicious. Yes. And our whole, <laughs> our whole goal this year with all the characters was to continually show a new chapter. Like if you judged a book by the cover last year, now we're opening the book. Oh, yep. Yep. She's still a, a professor at Columbia, but oh, look, she had a one night stand. And that duality is captured so beautifully when she's gushing to Miranda about it and two of her students walk by and she pulls up for a moment and then <laughs> reverts to giggling about how great it was to have no, it's such a good balance. Uncommitted sex. Yeah, it's such a good balance of of this character who's so wise in certain ways and so together. And then just being like, even, you know, even Charlotte had nightmare dating situations into her 30s. And so, like, there's a character who's truly, like, a noob out there. And it's such a fun, different flavor of her to emerge in this season that I think. And and just that the, the sex was just, like, uncomplicated fun, no, nothing more, nothing less. And just, like, the beautiful center on her path. It's, like, a really... Uh, gorgeous turn of and then the other plot twist which was really important and which i think we were all very excited with when we came up with in the genesis of the season was the angry laverne and shirley yeah <laughs> yes. maya and miranda moving in together was such a fun thing for us because it's it, it made them in the same place so we didn't it their runway collapsed and it does something that combines all the energies we wanted which is these Two people who you met in season one as completely uncomfortable with each other have now grown to know each other more through some shared personal experiences. They're both divorcing mm -hmm. and they're both trying to figure out their lives right. in the midst of all of this. And so. then we'll just go to the other single lady at that bar, which is Seema. Mm -hmm. So Seema goes home. She goes home and she has, I mean, <laughs> rousing round of, of sex with Ed, who's kind of a handsome Chris Pine type character. And then it's just, it's one of those things where he is very comfortable and tells her, you know, I have erectile dysfunction and no way that feels confident. And she's, you know, she's no judgment, which feels really refreshing and that that's not the butt of the joke. It's the actual whoosh and pump and all the, all the, <laughs> the sound and the contraption is where the humor lies and which we had a lot of fun with. And I think Michael... I th think came up with that initial concept of that there is there are these penis pumps for erectile dysfunction. But <laughs> we used mine. Is that yes. what you want no, me to say, Lucas? No. Those of us of a certain age all know women who had an experience yes. with someone yeah, yeah. with the bicycle pump, yeah. penis pump. I was very adamant that it be one of those uh, almost flower canisters yes. on your kitchen counter, <laughs> clear... <laughs> So the props meaning was very Vacuum funny. Press <laughs> thing. Oh and and the funny thing that you guys came up with in this scene that I thought is so funny is that the phrase I keep using is, is that cool? <laughs> I, I have some problem. Is that cool? Yeah, we won't have a problem tonight. So we're cool. Yeah, we're cool. And then he gets up and he unzips Sexy and talk. takes out the most uncool thing in the world. And now look, Sarita has not been known up until this point in her career as being a clown. She's a <laughs> heavy, gorgeous, sensitive, amazing, Mi heartfelt yep. actress, film actress. Mississippi Masala, oh, unbelievable. among others. Oh my so God, all of a sudden, movie. she's 
said, and Cynthia directed this episode, by the way, Cynthia Nixon. So this is Cynthia's really first, I think, sex scene rolling around on the bed. But to see Sarita go like, when he's pumping that thing up and you just, I think what I love about her comedy <laughs> is she plays it so real. Mm -hmm. She's horrified. Mm -hmm. And she just goes, yeah, we're cool. And it just goes, <laughs> <laughs> and it just pushes in on her face. So subtly, but she captures it all. And the, the humor, just the deflating. Yeah. But we love sets. that character for then persevering. Yeah. Because he was a nice fellow and he made her laugh. And so, yeah. and again, it underscores this character really is looking for love. She hasn't had a great love. Right. And just a, technically another back behind the curtain thing, when you're doing the shows, there's this thing called the sound mix where you go in after all the pictures are done and you enhance the sound. And there's a moment where he's, Fake or Ed is putting his junk into the canister and it's not really happening because we're faking it. And I was like, to sound guys, I was like, we got to make a sound. So it's got to sound like junk going into a thing. And it wound up being <laughs> chicken cutlets in a Tupperware container. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. So play it back just to yeah, hear that yeah, little yeah. jugga jugga jugga, whatever that sound is. That's how dedicated <laughs> and, we are to reality. Anyone who has ever pumped breast milk will relate to these unpleasant sounds. <laughs> anyway, so then the uh, that, and then her stunnedness leads us to her call Carrie to say that she's sorry she missed breakfast. In a typical and just like that stroll, Carrie's just walking down the street, looking fabulous, hearing the words penis pump from her friend Seema, which stops her dead in her tracks in the bike lane where she gets in the way of this character on a bike played by Peter Herman. And here we have a classic meet crash. She meets George and it's, I mean, like in general, New York, the past whatever decade or so, city bike bike lanes are so intense that you really do have to pay attention as a pedestrian at all times. I on no any longer yes. listen to books on Audible while walking down the street. <laughs> no, you can't do it. Oh, no. So then Peter's falls down and and uh, hurts his hand. So they go to the hospital. They go to the urgent care in this episode, and he broke his wrist. Yeah, and then had to get opioids, and Carrie waited for him. Yes. Which and is very sweet. It definitely feels like something Carrie would do. I don't know that I would uh, do that. I'd be like, I got to get out of here before this dude like actually sues me. <laughs> but I love a broken wrist meet cute. Yeah. And I love the fact that you actually let her be romantic and stay and nice. But she also says that line. I'm he knows my name and I'm actionable at this <laughs> yeah. point. Like <laughs> there is just a yeah. little bit that I could get sued in her mind. Yeah, but ultimately Carrie really does feel sorry for George enough that she goes to Cinderella. That's a, that's feeling sorry for someone to bring them soups. Samantha, would she feel bad for him if he wasn't he didn't look like that? No. And I say this. <laughs> <laughs> from my personal opinion, which is I wouldn't. <laughs> Listen, if I knocked an ugly dude off a bike, he'd have to call the FBI to find me. But knocking <laughs> Peter Herman off a bike, I would move into his home immediately. I'd be like, knock, come knock. to my house, actually. I'm a wrist specialist. <laughs> I know you've never heard of that before. And come to my house and I will take care of you. No, Carrie knows what's up. She's not trying to wait for a bum. She's just waiting for a hot dude. <laughs> she's she's trying too to busy. have a boo with a bum. <laughs> trying to boot yeah, up. She's yeah. not trying to be boot booed up. up with a bum. <laughs> She is trying to be wooed and romanced by a beautiful man. And I mean, I hope Peter doesn't put me on a watch list after this, but <laughs> he's so gorgeous. Peter, I watched every episode of Younger. I love you. But no, Carrie, for real, I mean, I think she'd care no matter what. But the waiting is because dude is fine as hell. I mean, we're agreed on this, yes. Yeah. She brings him food as a cover to say, like, but she thinks he's broke. That's the point. She feels guilty. She broke his wrist. He's a broke bum. He's a hot bum <laughs> in her mind. On a bike. <laughs> on a bike. A bum on a bike. Hot bum on a bike. Oh, I've dated many of those. Anyway, so th she discovers at the thing that, no, no, she's taken aback by the, the, the cool apartment. 
the grandeur of this apartment. There's art everywhere and kind of the space is just kind of overwhelmingly so. And then they organically, she starts to help him with his typing, which is an interesting uh, thing to offer. And it feels flirty in this way. And there's <laughs> big old kiss about to start. And then his partner comes in and he comes in with, with dry cleaning. And basically the whole, we get this whole idea, which we got a little bit, the urgent care, that this is the house husband, essentially, like that they're partners, business partners, mm -hmm. but it bleeds into like, what is this dynamic that Carrie's kind of taken aback from? And that also that Carrie kind of going over, giving the overview of like she thought, you know, single, she thought kind of sad. She thought this guy's dressed kind of terribly. She has all these uh, preconceived <laughs> notions of him. And she suddenly realized that she needs to open herself up to it, especially, you know, adding to it is Seema saying, I'm going to give this guy another chance. So everybody's yeah, kind of there's giving... a very important line in that Seema phone call to Carrie. Yeah. Where I think it's really radical where she says um, at well, the, first, the entry level opening of the door is at dating at this age, there's always something. And then she says, we had sexy foreplay, a bizarre intermission, and then 20 minutes of B plus sex. B plus sex. And then she says the shocking thing, I have to get myself off with most of these guys anyway. Mm -hmm. And when you see that on the page, it's shocking. But to actually put that out into the world, it's interesting. I think that's the reality, though, of a lot of I think it's when. a healthy, great way to look at things of just the expectations at, at any age are just we have all these ideas, but it's like everybody's a complicated, imperfect person. And so I, I love that, as always with SEMA, there's always kind of this refreshing, bigger picture take on things that I find deeply refreshing and a healthy point of view to put out there kind of just and sets it up for, you know, the comedy of the end, too. I, I also love that it's not an assault on men. It's not, oh, they're failing yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just this is the way it is, and imperfection is part of life. And also it's important yeah. to show that there's not one way to be. Like, seeing this yeah. whole thing about, so what, I ha I'll get myself off, is the direct opposite of Carrie. Mm -hmm. Carrie would never go like, okay, I'll just get myself <laughs> yeah. off. Carrie would be, that's not her mm -hmm. world at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Completely. I love it in contrast to the original show because there were so many boyfriends that it was just like, well, okay, bye. We're done with him. And I do love, I mean, it feels real that as you get older, you know, your your list of deal breakers gets a little shorter. <laughs> it's that, that John Dunn poem, they flee from me that at one time did me seek. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I love that. I love hearing someone say, you know, at this age, I give them a second chance. But Carrie mm -hmm. also is giving Peter another chance. She, three chances actually, like, oh, this guy's broken, busted, but I kind of thought he was cute. I felt something. I'm going to follow through, be a little bit of a caretaker, get a kiss, get yelled at by the big bad wolf buddy, but still <laughs> I'm going to go for a date. She says to Miranda, I got everything wrong in the goodwill. And that is a growth of age mm -hmm. saying, oh, guess what? I got everything wrong. Yeah. Not like I'm right. They're wrong. I got everything wrong, she says. The relationship comes to an end when they are making out on George's bed and Paul calls and yells at him and he leaves. And then she says, uh, that's it, because she doesn't want to be Yoko if they're Lennon and McCarthy. That makes her Yoko. <laughs> and, and she leaves. That last moment of her leaving that thing and that music coming on, that feels so familiar mm. to me yeah it feels so this this whole carry storyline feels very sex in the city to it's me. vintage uh mm -hmm. sex in the city with a new maturity yes yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well you know she's mm -hmm. wearing some vintage outfits <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a vintage story it works still but it is a story that she sort of on her own going out into the world she's gotten back on the bike which is a big journey we're in episode five uh she lost big in episode one of last year. So we're we're 15 episodes in. And she mourned deeply in episode three this year. No, yeah, yeah, And so, now so. she's not completely healed, but ready to move on. Yeah, and there's the energy where it's not like, oh, this tragic, like, oh, this date didn't go well. It's all like, it's like brush this off her shoulder and continues on yeah. that way. And just like yeah. a really- I am enough. Yeah. In and of really myself. Really delightful way that like this mishap is is really 
kind of special. So it's not only Carrie that really doesn't trust the situation she's in with Peter and gets thrown by her judgment and miscalling him as poor or whatever or a loser. Harry also doesn't trust the situation that Rock's in, which is <laughs> Rock is in the Central Park skateboarding and comes home with a card that a man has seen them skateboard and wants them to call about being a model for Ralph Lauren. So Harry immediately thinks, perv in the park, I work for <laughs> Ralph Lauren if I get to a Kinko's, all these funny, protective, paranoid <laughs> things. But it, it lights Charlotte up because it's Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. She goes from zero to 100 or skeptical to just all in. And what I love about this storyline is it's the first real story time where we've seen Rock and Charlotte together against an enemy, which is Harry's opinion. We have been doing some more research on the Ralph Lauren shoot. Uh, honey, absolutely not. I'm just, I'm really, I'm smelling a, a, a Taken type kidnapping vibe here. And I just, I don't have the muscle mass to rescue Rock from a compound in Belize. Dad, it's not a kidnapping vibe. We Zoomed with the advertising team and it's actually quite legitimate and impressive. It is a progressive family concept and Rock will be wearing a polo shirt exactly what I wore as a teen model. But in the same way that uh, Samantha was saying that it's so real, the moment that Miranda had with Brady of my little boy isn't my little boy anymore, in every family, there's the good parent, there's the bad parent, there's the parent who's the disciplinarian, and there's the parent who's the fun parent. On our parent. show, it's the fun parent and, and, the, yeah. and exactly, the tough parent. Exactly, exactly. And so, so for Charlotte to get to be the fun parent, when in fact we've always seen uh, Rock really more complicit with Harry, that's that's very real. So it was really fun to, to actually have uh, a Rock... Charlotte adventure, and it will continue because they did do the Ralph Lauren ad. Stay tuned. So Miranda and Shade um, have been trying to live as this sort of hybrid couple, night, day, understanding each other. Miranda's sort of been said, I'm going to move to Naya's. It'll be fun. And Che's going through what anyone in show business has gone through, if you're a writer. There is a moment where when you do a pilot uh, and all your hopes are pinned on it, um, just from the writing point of view, it, it's also very true of actors. There's a moment where the network evaluates the success by showing it to rooms of people, and they keep the people who are responsible for it, usually the writers, and occasionally an actor, and Che is an owner, actor, writer of this because... They're the owner of the concept because it was based on their life. So we have... I've been in many of these rooms. Susan, have you been in any of these focus rooms? Well, uh, uh, sadly, so many of my pilots never made it. <laughs> <laughs> it is Past hollow the script ground. Form. Yeah. I only had one and it was for uh, Showtime and it went directly to... We shot it and it was going straight to series. So I mean, it is... I, I skipped this... Not a bad... Group. Samantha, no, have, you, ex else have you experienced the two-way mirror yet? No, no. I've had a, many pilots rejected, but I have not gotten to see a focus group. I would um, die. Like, listening to real people talk about a thing I wrote that they don't like, I would simply pass away on the other side. Of the well, mirror. it's rough because this is very, I mean, this is designed exactly based on my experiences. Mm -hmm. And there is a group of handpicked people and they come from a bigger group. And then they just sort of handpick 12 people or 10 and they talk about it. Now we get to the exciting thing from the writing room. Our feelings about Che and the way the audience responded to Che. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a real interesting experience to have written this character that we thought of as a hero, mm -hmm. a strong, creative a uh, confident outsider individual and played perfectly by Sada Ramirez and then have the whole world go, nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nope with a mean. Nope. Nope. Uh, too confident, too cocky, too sure of themselves. And it's all complicated because Che also has been 
assigned as the destroyer of Steve. No, and the mm-hmm. destroyer of a character they love's marriage. and Yeah, so. which is, you know, you can't destroy a marriage, folks. Just because you're a strong non-binary stand-up, they're, they're, it just doesn't work. They're non-binary Camilla Parker Bowles. <laughs> it's yeah. not like twenty-first century. It's not kryptonite. <laughs> you can't like, oh, there's a happy marriage. I they saw my stand-up set. Yeah. Now they split up. <laughs> and so the interesting journey for us, in response, was in the first episode. Wow, that's an interesting new character, friend of Carrie's. In the third episode, they saw the stand-up. Everybody would say to me, "Chase, my new favorite character." I mean, we're that. Che Miranda episode went nuclear was in Tragically Hip, where they're in the kitchen and they finger while Carrie's in the bed peeing in a Snapple bottle, if you need to be reminded of that. <laughs> it turned for people, and, and they ran with it. What I wanted to do was show people what it feels like if you're that person, mm-hmm. just as a big experiment. Well, and I have to say, though, I never did the two-way mirror experience And I think you'll be able to relate to this, Samantha, as a writer, creator of color. I've been in countless rooms where I'm pitching something based on my own life, and I'm told, well, that's not real. (laughs) So to have someone look you in the face and tell you you don't exist is somewhat distressing. And the notion of people have an archetype in their heads of what a non-binary person is allowed to be and what's permissible, uh, that was very, very relatable in terms of being not of the majority. Yeah. Um, and then to actually be a character like Che, trying to do an ABC pilot, which we've already <laughs> tracked, was like Che complaining through the whole thing, like they're trying to make me a clown, they're trying to make me sad. And then for Che to be in the room and hear the only non-binary person in that room say that that was the wrong signal and Che thinks they're in the same side, and then that person continues with that. It's devastating. But it's also, it's the pressure, again, that you feel as a minority because there have been so few of us represented that you have to carry the load for everybody and there's no way you can represent everyone in your community. Something so powerful about when Che hears the non-binary audience member speak up, they perk up like everyone else is, you know, the Long Island woman, the, the guy from Times Square, they don't care about They love Tony Danza. They love, yeah, they love Tony Danza, and Che doesn't care about their opinions so much. They kind of think this is all flack, but then when someone from their own tribe of sorts, even though a tribe can be a thousand different things, it does just that that slight glimmer of hope, like they're going to get this, and then that disappearing was, I thought, and I think Sada performed it, you know, really powerfully. Well, and Michael, in addition to showing the audience what it feels like to actually see the person in real time absorb these hideous attacks, the notion of planting the flag that there are many ways to represent a community, there are many ways to embody non-binariness, that's a very important statement to make on behalf of people who are not, quote unquote, normative. There isn't one way to be or to do it. And not to mention that the it's a bit of a reach to do a frame on a frame, to do a frame of television on a show that's playing on a streaming series. But the reality is people kind of do take moments and think, we'll make a pilot out of that because that seems to be what's happening. And I knew countless stand-ups, countless, who had a good tight 40 minutes and were like hot. And then they went to the network and the network instantly deconstructed the energy that made them hot because it was too hot to handle for the audience. And then it starts to get watered down and watered down and watered down. From the minute we were coming back for season two, we knew we were doing this scene. This scene was everything you saw from Che from the beginning till now was about having the pilot fail. And uh, we did the pilot, we went to LA, we did the sunshine, we did the pomegranate juice, we did the Miranda, (laughs) we did it all. We showed all of LA and we showed that Tony Danza pilot and it was something that you would easily see on ABC because Tony Danza can make anything sound real and funny. And then we knew we were coming to this point where we would take away the ego. When you're lucky enough to get another season of television, It's all about who else are they? Mm -hmm. So we Mm -hmm. wanted to sort of break the ego to see what that does to the person Mm -hmm. and to maybe let Che 
whoever Che is, rise out of the broken shell. And, and have to look within in a way that they haven't in a while. I don't need a cheerleader. This isn't a game. This is my life. This is my career. This is my identity. It took me 46 years to figure out who I am and then a focus group one hour to fucking destroy me. So I don't need to be all Tony Robbins right now. I got it. You, as a creative person, often put a lot of yourself, whether it's on the page or on the stage. And so when someone says they don't like it, they're also saying, I don't like you, or that's how it's yeah. received. And oh, that's, that's like literally you. what, like the, what, that, what that person in the focus group says, they, I don't like you and I don't buy it. And then Che, the reason it's in the show is we wanted to say, now what? Miranda and Che are already a little bit bumpy. Now, Dark Knight of the Soul. And Miranda's. Pick yourself up, dust mm -hmm. yourself off, start all over again. I mean, it's like, <laughs> hey, wanna, it's literally Miranda doing the Che version of want to decorate the stoop. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so not where they are. Yep. But I love Miranda for saying it. I love, I mean, my partner Craig is always defending me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have these people who care about us so much that when we get hurt by uh, this machine, they're like, Fuck them. Right. <laughs> and and <laughs> our response is easy for you to say. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the interesting question to me is how people will respond to a vulnerable Che since they responded so uh, complex like to a cocky Che. Well, as you've said, this season is about opening the book and looking at different sides of people. And so to really investigate the inner heart of Che the other was a really the fascinating yeah. journey mm -hmm. that the actor carried off beautifully. I love a Che is a thing. I love that it's a flashpoint. It's a comment. It's a joke. It's an opinion. We put something into the world that wasn't there yet. And much like the focus group, they're like, we don't know what that is. But it's been a real treat. And this episode, Trick or Treat, was a treat because we got to really step out a lot of the characters in a direction that we've been dying to do. And it is a very tricky episode because there's a lot of stories, but uh, it is also, to pun ourselves, a treat. And just like that, this is the end of episode five, Trick or Treat. I had a blast. This was a treat. I want to thank Susan, Lucas, and Samantha. We'll be back next week to unpack episode six of the series called Bomb Cyclone. Stream new episodes of And Just Like That Thursdays on Max. Listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to your podcasts. And Just Like That, The Writer's Room is produced by Neon Hum Media for Max. At Neon Hum, Cher Morris is the executive producer. Joanna Clay is the lead producer. Sammy Allison is our head of production. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Sam Baer is our engineer. That's it for the show. Thank you for listening.